Hello, welcome to another episode of the Academic Connect Podcast, episode number five. Thank you so much for joining me today. Again, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like what I am doing here. I thank all of the listeners and subscribers thus far, not going to lie. Didn't think I would get any. (laughs) So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, Also, I recently put the Academic Canuck podcast on Twitter. You can find me at the uh, Twitter handle at Academic Canuck. That is at Academic Canuck. And you can follow the tweets there. And episodes will be uploaded onto that site as well. So again, thank you everyone for, for showing the support with that. Today's podcast is called Lewis and Chisholm and this is in reference to who I believe are highly influential and I I must say highly underrated epistemologists and philosophers Clarence Irving Lewis and Roderick Chisholm. C.I. Lewis uh, which I will refer to him uh, from here on out and Roderick Chisholm's epistemological work came out of the 20th century in which they presented some quite amazing ideas with not a lot of momentum inside of academia, which I find to be negligent in terms of epistemology and pedagogy. Uh, This, of course, you know, follows their kind of work, and in this episode I wanted to discuss some of their ideas, along with how they are observed and understood in a... uh, a, in a contemporary framework, so to speak. Uh, furthermore, uh, we uh, we can also attempt to understand these ideas in a framework of connected learning and what can be done uh, with these uh, frameworks in the future. Of course, my area of expertise in education is in interdisciplinarity, so how can we use uh, uh, Lewis and Chisholm's ideas towards uh, an interdisciplinary framework, so to speak. Uh, Before getting into that, though, I would like to look at how Lewis and Chisholm were observed in their time and the reason for why they were so underrated. Um, It should be noted that Lewis and Chisholm, and so far that Chisholm was a doctoral student of Lewis at Harvard, uh, so Lewis predated Chisholm, there is a lineage of knowledge there that is interesting. Uh, furthermore, they had prominence in the era b- between the 1940s and the 1960s, which was arguably the height of a new golden age of philosophical thinking that um, I would say took the concepts of the philosophy in the seven liberal arts or the, uh, the philosophita et septa martes liberalis uh, coined from Boethius back in 522. Uh, using the, the, the arts of grammar, logic, rhetoric, music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, they went towards dissecting and expanding the knowledge of these fields, all while bringing them together in a whole new way. I look at, uh, I mean, looking at that era of philosophy from the 40s and the 60s, or the 40s to the 60s, so to speak, that was kind of like the beginning and height of the, this new golden age of philosophical thinking. Um, you know, you look at certain philosophers such as Karl Popper, Quine, Edmund Gettier, Ludwig von Mises, Wittgenstein, Bertrand Russell, just to name a, a few um, new thinkers and economic thinking came to the came to the forefront with the Austrian school featuring thinkers like uh, Murray Rothbard, Karl Menger which kind of blends into the work of uh, Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman. Um, so you can see how there was a lot of names in that, uh, in that field and in that uh, epistemological field, so to speak, that there was a lot of competition. Um, it also brought on, you know, uh, a counterculture of sorts with challenges towards notions, not only in classical thinking, but... Uh, an antithesis to the thinkers of the Vienna Circle and the Austrian School with Frankfurt School thinkers like Marcuse, Adorno, Max Horkheimer, Jürgen Habermas. 
uh, along with some concepts presented from the, uh, you know, uh, the French intellectuals of postmodernists that I have mentioned before, such as Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean-Francois Lyotard, Roland Barthes, Fernand de Soissaire, and uh, although not French, Brazilian thinker Paulo Freire as, as members of this class, or so-called class. Uh, needless to say that Lewis and Chisholm came at a time where there were too many intellectuals or perceived intellectuals, perhaps even cults of personality that were floating around during that time. They didn't get their due, I would say, within the arena of ideas. So that's why I'd like to share them uh, with you today. Um, I think it's also important to point out that when discussing these concepts and ideas, they... I would say, you know, when you talk about the philosophers of the golden age, um, I, I think perhaps uh, some would say that they, uh, or would argue that Lewis and Chisholm were, were, I guess their ideas were maybe at the time undiscernible or undecipherable to some, but... I think, uh, you know, what this can provide is a, is a investigation into their work through a more uh, um, understandable lens, so to speak. Uh, so first, C.I. Lewis is, a, is an American-born. Um, he is from Massachusetts. He earned his Ph.D. at Harvard in 1910 under uh, the doctoral advisory of Josiah Royce, who comes from the epistemic lineage of German physiologist uh, Alfred Wilhelm Volkmann, uh, quite a prominent name there in terms of physiology. Um, during his academic life, he presided over the American Psychological Association, so the APA. Uh, academics out there who know of the APA, chances are you write in that style. <laughs> that uh, that C.I. Lewis uh, uh, presided over. He uh, he followed this concept that is called uh, philosophical logic, even offering challenges to some of the prominent uh, thinkers of that time, notably Bertrand Russell's concept of A precedes B to A actually implies B. So not that A just naturally comes before B, but A has an implicative factor on on the on B, so to speak. Uh, his biggest contribution came around how we think and form knowledge, as in epistemology, which ultimately led into his research methodology and how to actually do science. So Lewis formed a concept around connecting our perceptions to our sense of data that is presented as empirical truth. The best way to explain this is try to envision three columns, left, middle, and right. On the left side, you have an individual with their innate sense of perception looking at the two columns on the right or to the right, I should say. On the right, you have the sense data of a topic or concept. For example, we can describe what gravity is in its simplest form, such as it is the thing that keeps us on Earth. It's Newton's apple. It's throwing the baseball in the air, knowing it will come back down towards you. That's sense data. So we got the left column and the right column. In the middle is an empirical precedent, as in the concepts that explain the sensory data in the right column. These empirical precedent concepts are the certain a priori truths like mathematical concepts, scientific discovery, laws of motion, and of course, the laws of gravity. So in the middle, we have the work done by Newton, Einstein, etc. And that empirical precedent works to um, works to clarify our sensory data on a topic. 
so um like what that means is that we have a sharper image after knowing the empirical nature of a topic or concept so what lewis also suggests within that framework as well is that empirical truth can also be shaped to form our human condition so if our sensory data is to know that we as humans are to be benevolent and good empirical concepts as per lewis like aristotelianism platonism socratism stoicism etc etc act as the empirical precedent to clarifying the human condition the empirical concepts or empirical precedent acts as a pair of glasses to make something fuzzy more clear so to speak it presents definitely to me at least an interesting philosophical question on science and scientific discovery the question that it presents is did the hypothesis come to the scientists or did the scientists find the hypothesis both can develop two different paths towards a priori thinking both coming from sensing the data and the re relationship of precedent ideas what lewis i guess suggests here is that we all have the sensory data first it is with that intervention um so to speak yeah that intervention of that middle column of empirical precedent that makes the sensory data clearer so um another example i could use actually is the farmer so like a farmer can look at the soil and know that soil is where things grow if grass can grow so too can i cultivate and sow the uh, the field with crops the left column farmer and the right column sensory perception right there what the farmer would do next is perhaps test the soil for ph balance or meet with the local agricultural society to get a history of the plot what was there before what was planted before and this acts as a middle column of empirical precedent lewis his ultimate thesis is that experience does not form unless it comes from these empirical or a priori ideals which is counter to some of the ideas i presented in episode one on postmodernism postmodernism is completely opposite to this i would say postmodernism does not accept that intervention of empirical precedent because the sensory data is all that matters and it's sensory data is all that's accepted and there's multiple sensories of data so that those all are accepted because there's no empirical precedent um what I feel Lewis does here, he provides a more outworldly view on how we see the world through empirical ideas and foundational truths uh, and, and the coding and wiring that goes into it to develop a uh, deeper understanding on certain concepts. I mean, what happens with postmodernism for an example is that all this sensory data gets added in and then it essentially i'm trying to find the best word to describe this um it segregates certain parts of sensory data so if you have a sense on one topic in postmodernism if that's your truth that's your truth and that's your sense of the data or that's your sense of a concept and someone else's sense of a concept and so on and so on and so on and it segregates this understanding in many different fractionated forms lewis does not accept that he accepts that sensory data can be found sensory data can be observed 
and that even bad ideas or falsities can be observed through this empirical lens. Thus, if the empirical lens doesn't imply, that means it's not a good concept. Or if it's a good concept, an empirical lens can be applied to it. So he's essentially he's essentially taken out this opaqueness, this sense of narrowness that is applied in postmodernism and bringing a more outworldly view to it. Postmodernists would not only, they would disagree, but it would be in jest, you know, just because they feel like it doesn't uh, jive with their own concepts of truth and knowledge because they wouldn't be able to really understand Lewis or comprehend Lewis uh, on that level. Um, I would say, you know, moving on to his idea, um, a fundamental concept to Lewis's pragmatic concept comes from a reasoning on truth, not being just a purely anti-foundational or subjective measure, but that truth follows a dynamic objectivity throughout time so that the idea of foundational truth is out there and we can obtain it through science is the way that he thinks not that all truth is just subjective and based on experiential nodes rather we can use our experiential nodes with empirical precedent to follow a dynamic understanding on how we can build objectivity as we move through time. So it takes this, either this notion from some enlightenment thinkers of there is a foundational truth based in a, uh, either a God or a knowledge of the universe. And then it takes this postmodernist idea that there's no objective truth, everything is subjective and power and oppression dynamics and he just swipes those aside and says that truth is foundational and it's dynamic uh one of the his quotes and i'll state it here that that encompasses this perfectly the third element or phase the element which distinguishes our knowledge of the external world is the active interpretation which unites the concept and the given it is such interpretation alone which needs to be verified, or can be verified, and the function of it is essentially practical. Truth here is not fixed, but interpretation is not fixed, but is left for trial and error to determine. The criteria of its success are accommodation to our bent and service of our interests. More adequate or simpler interpretation will mean practically truer. Old truth will pass away when old concepts are abandoned. New truth arises when new interpretations are adopted. Attempted modes of understanding may, of course, completely fail and prove flatly false. But where there is more than one interpretation which can frame the given, truer will mean only better. And after all, even flat falsity can only mean a practical breakdown which has proved complete. Coming to the conclusion that truth can be changed only through the use of empirical precedents for coding sensory data, um, this quote kind of encompasses that. It provides that truth can be found and truth can be expanded upon and that failures in knowledge or false concepts of knowledge will always be presented but true ideas will defeat false ideas every time i think that's something to take away especially in this new age that we're living in i recommend thinking about that further as we move along that what you my concept in this day and age as true ideas as opposed to false ideas. And think of Lewis with that. In his 1946 work, An Analysis of Knowledge and Valuation, Lewis also creates, uh, I would say, an interesting idea, not just around truth, but the concept of truth and false. 
the verifiable idea and the unverifiable idea. So kind of going back to his conceptualization of uh, dynamic objectivity. I would say this goes hand in hand with the expansion of the experience or the stifling of the experience. It is a metaphysical understanding towards the felt goodness that goes beyond the pleasure as outlined by Stoics or Epicureans, so to speak. Rather, the goodness is tangible to how a process advances the experience. So he's bringing up some concepts of the scientific method here. So the experience and the goodness of that experience through a scientific process is what he is uh, discussing here. Uh, so with the scientific method, you could ask the question, how much does an idea or a, or a hypothesis move along a scientific method or the scientific method? How much the hypothesis is testable describes the goodness or badness of the experience on how much the test provides an alignment or partial alignment with the hypothesis with the hypothesis. If partial alignment, further restructuring of the hypothesis may need to be taken. This ultimately provides a concept of truth and false as closer to goodness or betterness, the closest to the truth. So your experience continues and your experience continues to be good the more steps you achieve in the scientific method. That's kind of coming from Lewis's standpoint. So I spent some time on Lewis there, uh, a good amount of time. We'll, we'll come back to him in the conclusion when I kind of bring both of them together. I'd like to move to Roderick Chisholm now, who is, uh, who is also an American born from Massachusetts. He earned his PhD through the doctoral advisory of C.I. Lewis in 1942. Uh, also from Harvard University. He tended to follow the epistemological philosophy similar to thinkers such as Immanuel Kant, David Hume, um, kind of those concepts of empirical knowledge and the forming of a, of a priori epistemic principles similar to Lewis as well. He also was notable in the objection to Quine's conceptualization of anti-realism and relativism in the realm of epistemic understanding, which was quite important. And, you know, he did he did a, a lot of work on that, which, although not as a uh, as a personality figure in the philosophical golden age of the 20th century, rather really solidified himself as a as a serious and impactful thinker on topics. Um, his most contributable form came from attribution and how the individual plays a role in the events that that individual will ultimately cause. When we shift to Roderick Chisholm now, um, and his conceptualizations go deeper with regard to the concept of truth and a priori understanding. When I look at both Lewis and Chisholm together, I see this kind of structure that Lewis provided the groundwork for Chisholm to work with, and that Chisholm took that groundwork and brought it to another level. So that's how I see that conceptualization. He went deeper with his thinking and went more outwardly with his thinking in terms of using it in many different areas. Chisholm constructed this concept and, and beautifully, I might add, but it can be hard to understand at first when discussing free will and determinism. What he concluded is that there are two types of causal actions when related to free will and determinism. First, that there is a concept called event causation, as in a state or string of events caused by previous events. Think of a, a boomerang, for example. And 
agent causation, as in a causation spurred on by the agent with a reaction, i.e. the thrower of the boomerang. Again, there's two conceptualizations here. There's the agent or the actor, i.e. someone like you, and the event that you are ultimately a part of during that time. What Chisholm outlines is this construct that, you know, either you have free will, you control the event at that time, or that event controls you to why you're there to begin with. So it's this kind of concept of indeterminism that Chisholm follows. I mean, another example that you could use is Newtonian laws of motion that are influential to these ideas of Chisholm as the first law incorporates events and agents, uh, say, for example, let's, yeah, let's take the first law. Um, the event would be the net external force of an object with the agent providing the external force. Or you could take the second law. The acceleration or the event is determinant on the acting force, the agent of acceleration, so to speak. Or even you could we could go to the third law. Um, you know, the equal and opposite reaction of an object you know, that's the event uh, to the agent's initial action. So this agent and event have do this intermingling between each other, and that's what Chisholm was trying to get at. Um, you know, Chisholm might conclude that free will and determinism are dependent on each other uh, as uh, as the agent has free will and the determining event is predicted on the agent's free will and a series of events that led up to this. A clearer example might suggest, um, you know, most classic philosophers accepted that the agent is causing the event where, you know, Chisholm would include that the event causes the agent act, agent's action, as stated earlier. I would say one of the most interesting yet challenging ideas of Chisholm relates to his, um, his 1967 paper, uh, Identity Through Possible Worlds. Uh, you know, some of these questions in this paper were very interesting, and it gave birth to the phrase Chisholm's Paradox. Um, so I think it would be a little bit fun to go into that right now. So, what, you know, what is Chisholm's Paradox exactly? The main premise of the paradox is that there are many possible worlds in the universe, and the actual world is just one among them solidifying what happens here is what actually happens here opposed to possibilities being possible on other worlds and justifications and necessities on other worlds as well this introduces new ideas around truth possibilities and justifications so to provide an example of this um, and where the paradox comes in is that so we know what actually happens on this world but we only know what's possible we can we can use and say science you know as an a priori truth but it's only just possibilities because it's not actualized on this world so <laughs> <laughs> I can already see some uh, in my in my mind's eye some heads uh, not grasping this, but that's okay. That's okay. When I first read it, I didn't grasp it either, but <laughs> it's fine. Let let me let me try and and provide an example. And I'm going to use Earth and planetary science and physics for understanding. So, what is something actual? in the actual world. Uh, the example I would use is the water cycle, okay? So on Earth, we have the water cycle. Evaporations from oceans, lakes, streams, condensation in clouds, precipitation through rain, surface runoff, groundwater, back into the ocean, etc., etc., right? This concept 
that is considered universal in our actual world, such as it's allowed based on the foundations of Earth. So Earth has this water, has an atmosphere to provide this condensation, etc., etc. Uh, has land mass to provide the runoff water and etc. and groundwater. Okay, so that is something actual in the actual world. That is considered, you know, science, uh, the capital S science on our planet. So let's go to the next stage now. Something possible in a possible world. An example I would use is the carbon cycle. So we had the water cycle in the actual realm. Now in the possible realm, we have the carbon cycle. As we are going to accept the a priori response, a la Lewis, with life forms and stars and energy providing 99% of the content in the universe. Thus, the carbon cycle involving carbon energy in the form of photosynthesis from a star or energy coming from a star, like the sun, creating organic carbon with microbial respiration, atmospheric carbon waiting for the, the, the process to happen over again. This is not to say that this is the case in all worlds, but the possibility with the right ingredients is inevitable. One of those ingredients being an energy source, uh, example of stars. So when we look at, you know, when, when these uh, astronomers do this research on planets that are uh, hundreds of light years away, there's a, um, there's a concept that if the rules follow the same with this star and a planet revolving around another star, that the car carbon cycle would be accepted, okay? Because the universe is made out of carbon. Thus, the carbon cycle is present here as it is somewhere else. It has to be. So that's where that kind of, the, this, this, poss it, this possibility in a possible world uh, through an a priori response. The third area is a justification as necessities in all other worlds or things. The best example of this and the easiest one is gravity. In order for the cycles to happen, both the water cycle and the carbon cycle, as in the dependence on a energy source such as a star at the highest level, gravity is constant. Gravity has to be there. Gravity is the ultimate governing force in our universe that that provides actualities and possibilities that can take place. You know, we look to Hawking and Thorne's work on black holes, especially are salient with this topic. You know, planets, stars, other cosmic anomalies, things are all governed by gravity. Thus, that is a justification as a necessity in all of the worlds or things. So it it introduces it. it we could say that. Um, you know, when, when we, you could use something in the form of a challenge towards science of, you know, if someone were to challenge the carbon cycle, which I don't know why anyone would, I don't know why anyone would dare want it, but you could use this kind of thinking towards understanding, well, carbon is 99% of the universe, thus... If it's true here, it's true everywhere else. Thus, we could call that a universal understanding and that gravity manages that. Thus, gravity is the ultimate foundational concept. I mean, so Chisholm's paradox is less about using truth as a means to expand, but more of using truth amongst many different realms and that there could be many truths, but within a certain hierarchy of conceptualization. And this leads to me now going into the final uh, part, the, the connections, and, and using the epistemology of interdisciplinarity. As in the connection of natural knowledge streams towards newer and perhaps higher orders of thinking, we can see that Lewis and Chisholm outlined a few concepts around this and 
I'm going to summarize their ideas in, in, in three distinct concepts. One, learning and knowledge comes from a precedent of knowledge to shape and code data for clarity towards ourselves, the agent. Two, ourselves, the agent, causes the event of knowledge spurned on by previous events of precedence, and that event was there waiting for our response. Three, truth or goodness and knowing can be advanced only as far as the precedent will take it and its connection to actuality, possibility, and justification. This connection of natural and innate thinking, I believe, is a foundational principle towards thinking. In my book, The Interdisciplinary Reformation, that I released in 2020, I make the argument that a set of anti-foundational truths ultimately create the foundational understanding that is either known or unknown to us depending on our event circumstance, thus the need for scientific discovery. In a way, the law of gravity is that foundational principle. Going back to Chisholm, if the actuality of the water cycle is not present in a world, does it cease to have gravity? Well, the answer to that is no, given the laws of our universe. Some might say those laws are only constructs, so why is the law of gravity not just an actuality? I would then say, in, in, in contention to that, you would have to return to Lewis on what we know about gravity stemming from a precedent of empiricism. If your data is coded in a different way, well, you have to explain through empirical precedent that actualizes or justifies this coding. Thus, if you're going to challenge a law or science in that way, you have to explain it through empirical precedent that actualizes or justifies your own coding of the situation. If not, you must then accept the precedent as it's constructed and that it flies above your perceived deconstruction. That is the best way I can describe that. What we can conclude from these two philosophers, Lewis and Chisholm, is that epistemic truth can be observed, quantified, and even tested. Furthermore, it relies on the individual to trust their knowledge and to use it towards obtaining new knowledge and coding their epistemic data. With that said, let's move to the section of reading and watching. I plan on doing a further deep dive into Chisholm's identity through possible worlds, some questions, um, perhaps even doing a blog about it. So that's what I plan on reading. Watching, well, I've been getting into a <laughs> A classic TV show that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, Rowan Atkinson playing the fumbling, bumbling, and goofy Mr. Bean. One of my favorite shows. And I've uh, been watching a few clips on, on YouTube and watching some full episodes that I can find. So uh, I say in this time of craziness, sometimes it's good to just uh, get a laugh in any way you can. Uh, so with that said, I just want to say again... Thank you for listening to the Academic Canuck podcast. Again, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for all the content and all the updates. Again, I thank everyone for uh, who has already subscribed and liked all that. And uh, don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Uh, the Twitter handle is at Academic Canuck. That is at Academic Canuck. Uh, so feel free and follow me there. All right. Uh, with that said, take care, be safe, Academic Canuck, signing off.